Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Rosemary Hunter, who's a professor at Kent Law School and um, works in the area of gender, sexuality, human rights, family law. Um, I really do human rights. Don't you? No. You publish some good things on access to justice yes. and yeah. human rights. Yeah. That comes yeah. in my mind, yeah. wide vision of human rights. Um, and lead with uh, Claire McGlynn and Erica Rackley on the Feminist Judgments Project, uh, which you can talk about today. Okay, all right. right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gina. Thanks very much for the invitation to come and speak. And of course, when I when you sent me the invitation, it's a very long time ago, and I thought, oh, this is a good excuse to make me think about a certain issue that I have been sort of been floating around in my head. I, I converted those things that I had been floating around in my head onto a piece of paper and then of course you know, didn't have time to think about it for the, until last week when I found that I'd lost the piece of paper. So <laughs> um, uh, this, is, this is more in progress than I had perhaps planned it to be, but you don't have to know that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm obviously it's build as being a feminist judgments project. I'm going to stray from that a little bit, um, but it's more around those theoretical reflections that have been prompted by the feminist judgments project, and it's very much thinking in progress. So I hope that your feedback at the end will help to push my thought process a bit further along. Um, but I will begin with the feminist judgments project, which as Jenny said, I was one of the organisers, and it involved a number of, forgive me if I'm sort of telling you things you know already, but a number of feminist legal scholars, mostly academics, but a few practicing lawyers as well, setting out to, to write additional feminist judgments in a series of um, existing English legal cases. So instead of just critiquing the judgments from a feminist perspective, we thought we'll, we'll actually rewrite the judgment as we think it might have been written by one of the judges who was on the bench at the time had they been a feminist or a different feminist from the one who was there. Um, and so the judgment writers were subject to all the same constraints as the original judges. They had to decide according to law. They had to decide by reference only to the material that was available to them at the time um, and in response to the issues that were um, identified in the arguments put to the court by the opposing parties. Um, and the resulting judgments actually demonstrate quite powerfully, given those constraints, how even at the time that they were originally decided, these cases could have been reasoned and or decided differently. Um, and so in doing so, the judgments kind of demonstrate the contingency and the lack of inevitability of the original decisions. Um, and they also expose, and I guess seek to correct, some of the biases and predispositions of the judges who made them um, and of the law itself. Um, the, the actual the idea for the Feminist Judgments Project came from Canada. Um, so there was, a, there was a group that had set themselves up as what they call the Women's Court of Canada, which grew out of their Legal Education and Action Fund, which is a, um, an organisation that had been intervening in Canadian Supreme Court cases to advance a particular a substantive vision of equality um, in Section 15 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. So Section 15 is the, the clause that guarantees equality before and under the law, and they wanted the court to, you know, they, they specifically had a program to try to encourage the court to adopt a substantive view of equality rather than a formal view of equality. Um, and they had some initial success in their interventions, um, but found themselves having a really dwindling impact. So initially the court had said, oh, you know, take a notice of their um, arguments, incorporated some of them, uh, followed some of them, but they had got the impression that the court had then said, well, okay, we've done equality now. Um, you know, we've heard everything you've got to say. <laughs> no, obviously novel issues keep coming up, um, but the court had really stopped taking much notice of what they were saying. So they were trying to sort of nut out how to get the court to pay attention to their arguments, 
and they hit on the idea of, well, if, if they won't take any notice of the brief that we submit in the case, why don't we just show them how they should have written the judgment? Um, and you know, show them how to do it by rewriting the judgments in which they disagreed. Um, and so that's where the idea of rewriting judgments came from. Um, the English project, of course, was much broader than the Canadian one. So the Canadian one was focused around a particular body of jurisprudence, which is the Supreme Court's um, case law of Section 15 of the Charter. The English project was much broader. It was basically taken across the whole body of English law, um, just whatever people wanted to write about or whatever cases people wanted to choose. So whereas the Canadians subtitled their project Rewriting Equality, the, the subtitle that we used for our project was From Theory to Practice. So it was really about putting feminist theory into practice in the form of judgments and to see whether it could be done and how it could be done. Um, now, obviously, writing judgments is a very different genre from writing academic essays. So we had to think about how to write judgments and also what it means to write feminist judgments. You know, what kind of things might make a judgment count as feminist? Um, now, and, and it's that sort of problematic that we've been sort of worrying away at, or that I've been worrying away at, um, both before and since. Um, now, obviously, the outcome is one clear thing that might make a judgment feminist. So the judgments are generally concerned to correct some form of injustice to, to a woman or to women more generally. Um, but not all of them ended up, not all of the judgments um, in the project ended up with a different result from the original decision. About two thirds of them did, but the others didn't. Um, and in a couple of cases that was really because of what the judgment writers found to be the constraints of the law. So they just couldn't make it go where they wanted it to go or to produce the result that they wanted it to produce despite their best efforts. And that was sort of a really important lesson about the limits of feminist judging and the fact that the law isn't completely contingent and open, that it does have sort of boundaries. Um, but in other cases, the feminist judge actually agreed with the result but wanted to reach it by a different route. So, in other words, the feminist intervention was in relation to the reasoning adopted by the other judges or the court rather than the result per se. And that alerts us to, to sort of some other ways in which a judgment might count as feminist. So, a judgment might be feminist by virtue of the feminist theoretical position that underlies both the reasoning and the outcome. Um, but the key word here really is underlying um, because as, how many of you are lawyers, law students? Some, but not all. Okay, all right, that half. Um, so, so, so that, <laughs> I, <laughs> okay, and some who aren't admitting to it. <laughs> 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 it used to be, but I'm not yeah, happy. That's all right, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully explain sufficiently for those who are um, to, to get the picture. So, a legal just judgment has to consist of three basic elements. So, you've got the facts of the case, the relevant law, and then applying the law to the facts. Um, and you'll notice, of course, that feminist or any other kind of theory doesn't come into that list. Um, so feminist theory isn't a source of legal authority, and since it can't, hence it can't really form any part of the reasoning process that the judge employs in reaching a legal decision. Um, and so there might be some scope for citing feminist theoretical literature um, as kind of background material that might assist the judge to interpret the facts, but otherwise the judge's theoretical approach has to remain fairly implicit rather than being obvious on the face of the judgment. Um, so even though it might have a quite a strong influence on how the facts are understood and categorised, how the relevant law is framed and interpreted, that's, that's all sort of implicit in the judgment rather than being explicit on the face of it. And it was quite interesting, um, in fact, that, that well, the, the difference between some of the drafts of the judgments, which you know, quoted feminist theorists a great length, and then as editors, we kind of took the red pen to those bits and said, well, you know, Catherine McKinnon isn't a source of authority. Um, <laughs> neither should have um, so, <laughs> so we have to kind of bury that. And, uh, and, and I mean, we just sort of adopted our Nike slogan and just do it. So don't, don't say what you're doing, just actually put it into practice. Um, and, and operationalise it through the, the legal requirements of the
decision. So that was an interesting process because, um, in fact, some, there's been some argument about well, how do you identify feminist judgments and and a sort of obvious answer to that is, well, you would do a word search and look for the word feminist. But that's almost, by definition, the word feminist isn't going to appear in a feminist judgment um, because the judge is not flagging their theoretical position. They're just doing it. Um, so so this, but nonetheless, there might be a sort of feminist theoretical um, or philosophical um, underpinning to the judgment, which might be what's making it feminist. And then there's a sort of third element which is that the literature has identified, um, I guess, certain procedures of feminist judgment, which might not lead to any determinate result, but are about the way the judge approaches her task of judging. And it's these procedures of feminist judgment that I'm going to focus on for the rest of the seminar. Um, so in an article in 2008, I reviewed the previous literature, which suggested various ways in which a feminist judge may or ought to approach her role. And these included doing things like um, what's called asking the woman question, so examining and highlighting the gender implications of apparently neutral rules and practices. Um, so, so if you've got something that appears neutral, what are the gender implications, what are the gender impacts of this particular rule, and also then you might extrapolate to that to think about the race, the impacts, religious, sexuality, and so on. Um, including women, which includes taking into account women's interests um, in the framing of legal rules and norms rather than only male interests or male interests masquerading as universal human interests. Um, and also hearing and understanding the stories that women litigants tell and recounting those stories in decisions. So putting gendered experience into legal discourse in a way that hasn't previously been included. Um, and also it might involve the judge informing herself about the diversity of women's lives, talking to other women, referring to relevant research and so on, rather than simply relying on her own experience. Uh, another process might be ensuring that gender bias doesn't go unchallenged. So resisting hegemonic discourses of sexism, racism, heteronormativity, rejecting stereotypical assumptions and myths about sexual difference or particular gender behaviour and critiquing other judgments that adopt or fail to question those myths and stereotypes and hegemonic discourses. So um, in, in some cases you will find it, a, a dialogue between the judges in the case where you might have um, you know, some male uh, judges, some stereotypical things about women which the um, feminist judge might think correct. Um, the idea of uh, contextualisation and particularity and attention. So using, some of this comes out of a, a very old article now by American academic called Catherine Bartlett. She referred to this notion of feminist practical reasoning, which is reasoning from context rather than in the abstract, um, which might include sort of referring to social framework evidence, social science research literature, policy documents, as a context for both the facts and the law and then also producing particularised decisions. So treating the people before the court with equal respect and dignity, paying close attention to them, avoiding categorisation, um, rendering kind of fresh judgement in, ev in every case. So that's referring to a Derridean or Levinasian kind of ethics. And focusing on the realities of people's lives rather than the sort of narrow doctrinal issues. And, and often you can, you can see the difference how um, in the way that a judge might begin a judgment, um, whether they begin it by saying, you know, this is a legal issue or this is a very difficult issue for the judge to decide, or do they begin it by saying, this is a case about this person? Um, and that's, that's, a, that's an illustration of that difference. And then also making feminist choices. So where there are different feminist possibilities or all of the options are invidious in some way, um, not judging other women adversely because they made different choices from the ones the judge might have made, thinking carefully about the consequences of decisions. This, you know, this might be good for this person, but does it have adverse impact somewhere else? Can you minimise those impacts? Um, being open about the priorities and trade-offs that you make, being prepared to justify your, your choices and being accountable for the result. Um, and that, that, so having sort of laid that out in that article, that article then 
form part of the background material on judgment writing that we provided to the participants in the Feminist Judgments Project and was specifically used as a reference by at least some of the judgment writers. So, you know, not surprisingly, when we came to, to analyse the judgments that were produced by the project, um, they sort of quite strikingly exhibited some of these characteristics or procedures of feminist judging. Um, and I, I talked about that in one of the introductory chapters in the book. And so what seemed to be distinctive about the, the feminist judgments that were produced in the project um, were four things in particular. So, first of all, the, the judgments often told the story differently. So they recounted the facts in a way that differed from the original judgments. And that included paying close attention to the person involved and giving voice to women who had been silenced or sidelined in the other judgments. Secondly, the use of contextual materials. So almost all of the feminist judgments introduced additional social framework material to place the particular facts of the case and all the legal issues involved in a broader context. Um, and that those materials were derived from research evidence, legal materials from other jurisdictions, policy documents, committee reports, parliamentary debates, law commission reports. Um, but also what I have called sort of feminist common knowledge, um, which is, uh, you might be familiar with the concept, or some of you will be familiar with the concept of judicial notice, where um, rather than requir requiring evidence of facts that are absolutely so notorious that they don't really need to be evidence, like the sun will rise in the morning and the sky is blue, um, then a, a judge can take what's called judicial notice of these notorious facts. So they're really sort of, but, but judges do tend to stretch that concept rather beyond that. So they make assertions about the state of the world based about all sorts of things, not necessarily things that are particularly notorious. Um, and so some of the things that feminist judgments do is to make these statements about the world backed by judicial authority um, using feminist knowledge. So it's, you know, what we know, what is well known about, you know, the difficulties of reporting child sexual abuse or the difficulties of leaving um, a violent relationship or the fact that victims of rape don't you know, might react in a whole range of different ways and are certainly not necessarily likely to tell the first person who comes along. So those kinds of feminist knowledge get sort of incorporated as assertions backed by judicial authority um, in the, the judgments, which of course again introduces feminist knowledge into the text of the law. Um, thirdly, the thing about challenging gender bias, um, both in legal doctrine and in judicial reasoning, so a couple of cases where the facts of the case raised particular issues where women were being judged by the original judges in particular ways, and the feminist judge, you know, calls a halt to that and, and draws attention to the sort of stereotypical view that is being taken of wives or, you know, what wives do or should do or ought to do and how mothers ought to behave and so on. And also um, in the sort of stereotypical gender bias in legal doctrine, so um, some of the, I mean, the sort of classic case about the assumption that um, a victim's sexual history is relevant to um, you know, determining whether she consented in a, in a rape case, which is directly challenged, or um, the way in which the defence of provocation has been framed in such a way that it's much easier to access for um, you know, people who lose their temper than for women who have been subjected to sustained abuse. So they're sort of particular examples. And then also the judgments um, challenge other kinds of biases, so class bias, cultural or religious biases, heteronormativity, other kinds of taken for granted assumptions um, and social and political prejudices. And then the fourth thing, which really hadn't come up in the previous literature, was a kind of persistent anti-essentialism. Um, so the judgments display a, a marked resistance to universal or essentialist categories and classifications. Um, and so, for example, uh, just the idea of, um, in, in one of the cases, there's a question about whether a particular vulnerable young woman has the capacity to consent to marriage. And the issue is that she wants to marry a much older man who has a history of 
um, violence and sexual abuse, and the local authority is trying to <laughs> prevent this marriage, and she's like, hang on, you know, I'm an autonomous human being, I should be able to consent. And the, the judge who dealt with the case took a very simple, you know, marriage is a very simple thing to understand. Um, it's, you know, and so the question is, does she have sufficient capacity to understand this very simple notion of, you know, what a marriage is? And the, the feminist judgment sort of de-essentializes marriage. So it says marriage isn't always the same thing, um, but what we have to do is look at the particular marriage that is in issue. Um, so does she have the capacity to consent to this marriage and the consequences of marrying this man, which doesn't necessarily deprive her of the capacity to consent to a different marriage with a different person. It sort of unpacks that sort of box of marriage and says we need to look at it in the individualised circumstances of the case rather than thinking of it as just a single thing. So that, that sort of anti-essentialism is really a kind of new phenomenon, a new feminist theoretical concern manifesting itself in the judgments in the way that I talked about before without being spelled out as such, but something that seems to be coming through in the way that people were writing and thinking um, about the particular issues involved. Um, now, in that 2008 article, I did note some similarities between the idea of producing particularised decisions and the feminist ethic of care in terms of the notion that women's um, different moral voice is relational, connected, caring, nurturing, responsible and just rather than abstract, distance, calculating, disengaged and legalistic. Um, however, in that article, I quite quickly dismissed the ethic of care as a model for feminist judging um, on the grounds that it was stereotypical and essentialist. Um, and then last year, I actually had occasion to um, revisit, to go back and reread the feminist ethic of care literature and actually began to wonder whether I had been rather too quick to dismiss it um, in my earlier thinking. So while, so I'm going to sort of move on now to think about the ethic of care and how that might be relevant to my concerns about feminist study. Um, so while 1980s versions posited the ethic of care as a specifically feminine ethics derived from women's experience of maintaining relationships or more specifically of mothering, Later versions have tended to eschew such essentialist foundations and have seen it rather as a feminist ethics, offering prescriptions for moral action which are capable of attending to and addressing gender power differentials and inequalities. So according to Selma, whose last name I can never pronounce, <coughs> you know who I mean, Selma Sevenjusen, um, the ethics of care as a moral activity requires judgments about what is the best course of action in specific circumstances, which is a question which engages situated contextual reasoning rather than abstract reasoning, or the application of a set of predetermined principles. So moral problems are approached from an attitude of caring, a willingness to deploy emotions, such as sympathy, empathy, sensitivity, and responsiveness, um, and a commitment to see issues from different perspectives. Uh, so caring involves sustaining relationships, an ability and willingness to see and hear needs, and to take responsibility for those needs being met um, and recognition of differences in need. But all of this sounds rather like the feminist procedures for judging that I outlined earlier. Um, the idea about including women, challenging gender bias, contextualization, particularity and attention, making feminist choices. Um, and it also has a particular <coughs> resonance with a strategy that was employed by some of the feminist judgments, which was to kind of sidestep dilemmas about competing rights, um, such as the clash of interest between the defendant and the victim in a rape case, or between the fetus and the mother when we're having abortion debates, um, by reframing them as issues of multiple responsibilities. So the traditional legal approach um, in that situation of sort of clashing rights is, for, well, first of all, to see it as an issue of clashing rights, and then to construct a hierarchy of rights and decide whose rights are trumps. And strangely, women often come out as the losers in that calculus. Um, so understanding the issue as one of multiple responsibilities means less reliance on abstract rules and principles of presumptions in favour of, in favor of a contextual analysis that pays attention to relationships, needs, dependency, cooperation and care. Um, so I started to think, might it be useful to think about feminist judging, or indeed any judging, as a practice of care? 
Now, one immediate objection um, to that idea is the kind of theoretical opposition between the ethic of care and the ethic of justice, um, and particularly the notions of strict neutrality, impartiality, decision making according to law, by which judges are absolutely bound. And so some theorists have seen the ethic of care and the ethic of justice as simply incompatible. Um, others have tried to find some accommodation between them. So for example, Virginia Held um, says that, well, yes, they're both important, but some of them, one has more salience in different fields. Um, so care is more important in these areas, justice is more important in these areas, but she concedes the legal field entirely to the ethic of justice, so that doesn't help me terribly much. Um, but by contrast, Robin West, um, in the first chapter of her 1997 book, Caring for Justice, takes a strong and I think defensible position that justice and care are necessary conditions of each other. So she says justice must be caring if it is to be just, and care must be just if it is to be caring. So she argues that the goal of adjudication should be not only to achieve justice, but also to exercise compassion or care for litigants. And she contends that um, the judge-litigant relationship imposes caring constraints on decisions, um, including the requirement to take into account the individual circumstances and particularity of the parties, rather than universalizing or commodifying them. And she goes on to provide numerous illustrations um, from US case law of justice without care, um, which is ultimately unjust. Um, and she contends that many instances of glaring injustice in judicial decision making could and should have been avoided by a more compassionate interpretation of the applicable law. And she also provides a similar set of instances of care without justice, which is ultimately uncaring. So we might put in that category, for example, care for defendants in rape cases against the lack of justice for their accusers in those cases. Um, so if we follow then Robin West, the idea that caring and justice are necessary conditions of each other. Um, a second objection to thinking about judging as a practice of care might be the argument that judging is not a moral activity calling for moral judgment, but a legal activity calling for legal judgment, which is a very specific and bounded thing. Now, that's a bit like the ethic of care versus the ethic of justice point. And, and I give a similar answer. So I think that legal judging in requires both legal and moral judgment. Um, so there are many aspects of judging, particularly at appellate level, where the law doesn't compel a particular conclusion, as demonstrated you know, graphically by the fact that you can have feminist judgment projects. So, um, I mean, obviously, if, if the law did always compel a conclusion, then we wouldn't have any cases. <laughs> there would be no point going to court and wasting your money on something where the, the solution um, was simple. So, obviously, the feminist judgments as a collection and critical and postmodern uh, post-structuralist theory more generally clearly demonstrate considerable scope for moral or what critical legal scholars would say is political judgment um, by judges, for example, in exercising discretion, in judging the credibility of witnesses, in interpreting the meaning of uh, words and statutory provisions, in following or distinguishing precedents, in classifying facts as falling within or outside particular legal categories, um, or when called upon to extend the law to novel situations, or even in deciding whether a situation is novel in the first place. So that's not a claim that the law is entirely open and contingent, as I said earlier. Um, but it's clear that both judicial experience and judicial philosophy form important elements of legal decision making. And that's another possible theoretical objection to thinking about judging as a practice of care, is the questionable status of the ethic of care as a feminist construct. Now, Maria Drakopoulou has argued quite persuasively that once the ethic of care became detached from its moorings in women's experience as mothers and carers, then it ceases to be a distinctly feminist ethics and simply becomes another humanist ethics. Um, now, if I want to argue that all judges sort of should adopt this approach, then perhaps that's not a bad thing, um, in that judges might be more amenable to something called humanist than to something labeled feminist. Um, but I think it's rather a cowardly tack to take. Um, and why would I want to promote something that I didn't really think was feminist in the first place? So I'm just going to leave that one hanging and, and move on to some more sort of practical teaching for my concept. That
Um, but, I mean, whatever the theoretical correctness of Dracopoulos' point, I think the concept of the ethic of care is inextricably associated with feminism, um, which I discovered when I floated the idea of judging as a practice of care with some Australian colleagues who are studying the work of magistrates. Now, in Australia, the magistracy is salaried and professionally qualified, which is different from the voluntary lay magistracy that's found in English magistrates' courts. And so my colleagues have been doing all this work around um, the work of magistrates, and they suggested that we collaborate in thinking about whether there is such a thing, can be such a thing as feminist judging in the magistrates' courts, and if so, how it might be manifested. So the magistrates' courts deal with the vast majority of criminal cases, a large proportion of civil cases. They're high volume courts, they deal with matters quickly, they apply the law routinely, there's little scope for reflection or creativity. Um, and much of the work of magistrates is about managing the courtroom and the people in it, rather than decision making as such. But given the importance of interpersonal interactions in that context, it seems, to, it seems to me to be quite a good site to see if we could identify magistrates engaged in practices of care. Now, the suggestion that we should do this, and we have the whole set of transcripts which we were going to read and see what we thought. So I said, well, let's look and see if they're doing care. Um, so a couple of reactions that might suggest and receive. So first, um, these colleagues being liberal feminists at best, um, they sort of instinctively recoiled from the concept of care. Um, so they were happy to investigate specific behaviours, such as courtesy, patience, empathy, problem solving, looking and speaking directly to litigants. Um, and they were happy to, to sort of subsume those behaviours under labels such as engaged judging or non-adversarial judging, but they didn't want to call it care. Um, and secondly, they pointed out that what I seem to be talking about sounded very much like um, so-called therapeutic jurisprudence which is implemented in problem-solving courts and sees the court system as responsible for addressing the problems that lead people into court in the first place, such as alcoholism, drug addiction, domestic violence, rather than simply processing them through the revolving door of imprisonment, release, further offending, further imprisonment, and so on. And now, I actually don't think feminist judging is the same as therapeutic jurisprudence, um, although possibly therapeutic jurisprudence might be a subset of feminist judging. Um, but I need to do more work to tease out the kind of similarities and differences and, and overlaps. But what was interesting in this dialogue with my colleagues was the notion that if something already has a label, therapeutic, then that precludes it from being feminist or from being care. Um, now, obviously, I don't agree with that. I mean, I think if other people appropriate our ideas and call them something else, then that doesn't automatically make them into something else. But that, that is a sort of point where say, well, no, it can't be feminist because it's, it's called this. Um, and I, I don't think those two things are necessarily mutually exclusive. But the episode did suggest that I was right to suspect that something labelled humanist is likely to be more acceptable to a legal audience than something labelled feminist, and particularly something labelled care. Um, but it also made clear to me that I'm not yet ready to give up either feminism or care, um, no matter how strategic that might be. Then a further challenge to my thinking um, came from a different direction, which is the work that I'm now doing on the Australian Feminist Judgments Project. So this is similar to the English Feminist Judgments Project in that it's rewriting judgments across a wide area, but it's got some extra elements in it, um, including interviewing real feminist judges about their judicial practice um, and uh, you know, seeing what they say about what it is to be, what they perceive to be a feminist judge. Um, and there's actually, in, because of the federal structure of the judiciary in Australia, the, there's more superior courts because they're at both federal and state level, um, and the intermediate courts sort of tend to have a higher profile. So there's actually um, quite a lot of women judges, a higher proportion of women judges than in England, um, many of whom came out of the community legal sector of the feminist movement um, in the 1980s. So judges who self-identify as feminists are not that hard to find. Um, and so we, we're in the process of doing a number of interviews and the, the set that we've done so far are all from one state. So this is very much sort of preliminary data. But the judges that we've spoken to broadly break down into three groups. So there's one group which rather disappointingly says, I'm a feminist and a judge, but I'm not a feminist judge. Um, 
and you know, there's, there's a number of reasons for why they say that, which I won't, which is a bit of a diversion, but I'm happy to answer questions about that if you'd like to ask them. And then there are those who are happy to admit to being feminist judges, but they describe their practices in different ways. So a handful of them are definitely quite clearly care feminists. So they emphasise empathy, understanding, particularity, respect, responsibility. One even refers directly to caring for the parties um, who come before her. And they come across in these transcripts, in the interview transcripts, as warm and lovely people. Now, a couple of the others take a more intellectual approach. They focus more on feminist issues rather than sort of feminist process. Um, and they talk a lot about how difficult and challenging it is to be a feminist judge and how they've been treated badly by their colleagues as a result. And they come across as a bit dogmatic, a bit angry, somewhat embittered. Now, <laughs> now, I know all of these feminist judges very well. And I know they're different personalities, and I know that some of the nice ones um, have also experienced appalling disrespect as judges, but choose not to mention it. Um, and I know that the angry ones are angry for very good reasons. But my younger colleagues on the project, who don't know everyone so well, and are a bit questioning of their own feminism, um, decided that they really liked the style of the warm, lovely judges, and they wanted to embrace them as models. But they found the angry, dogmatic ones off-putting. Um, and that actually gave me some cause for concern. Because um, if, by positing feminist judging as a practice of care, I don't want to valorise a particular feminist style or approach above all others. Um, I'm not sure if I think there might be different ways of doing care, or if, or if I think there's a caring way of doing feminist judging and another way, or other ways. Um, and it could also be a matter of presentation, because obviously what someone says in an interview might well be different from what you find by reading their judgments or what you'd see observing their courtroom. Um, it's interesting, too, that one of the angry judges has done a lot of work both on and off the bench in the area of child sexual abuse, which is an area in which she would probably say, as I suggested earlier, that there has been far too much care for defendants and too little justice for complainants. So perhaps um, that might be why she doesn't embrace that particular approach. So that sort of made me think harder. And then finally, I want to turn to an appellate judge who might seem to exemplify the notion of judging as a practice of care, which is Brenda Hale, um, who's previously the only woman ever to sit on the House of Lords and still the only woman on the UK Supreme Court. Now, she's delivered some notable judgments which are at odds with her male colleagues and in which she's engaged in situated contextual reasoning, expressed great empathy, sensitivity and responsiveness towards women litigants, um, sustained relationships, seen and heard litigants' needs, taken responsibility for meeting them, recognised differences in need. Um, and I've got a whole series of examples here and probably not enough time to go through them, um, but I'll just mention a couple, um, probably a couple of the most famous ones. So one is the Gentle case, um, which is a case brought by um, mothers of soldiers who were killed in the Iraq war. And they... Um, took action, what they were trying to do was to compel the government to hold an independent inquiry to establish whether it had taken reasonable steps to be satisfied that the invasion of Iraq was lawful under international law. Um, and Hale agreed with the rest of the court in holding against the claimants, so you know, it was just legally impossible to reach the result that they wanted. But in the course of her reasoning, she kind of stepped out of the legal analysis to address the following paragraph directly to the families involved. This is what she said. She said, not surprisingly, the mothers of these young men want to know how and why their sons had died. The circumstances surrounding their deaths must have raised many questions in their minds. The army inquiries took time and they did not feel that they had been kept fully informed. They felt with some justification that even in a situation of armed conflict, these particular deaths might have been avoided. But on top of those inquiries, they wanted to know why their sons had been sent to Iraq at all. What they really want is an inquiry into whether or not the conflict in which their sons died was lawful. If the use of force was lawful, it would be of some comfort to know that their sons had died in a just cause. If it was not, there might at least be some public acknowledgement and attribution of responsibility and lessons learned for the future. 
If my child died in that way, that is exactly what I would want. I would want, her to, I would want to feel that she had died fighting for a just cause, that she had not been sent to fight a battle which should never have been fought at all, and that if she had, then someone might be called to account. Which is just such a, I mean, that sort of makes me tear up, actually. <laughs> um, it's such a sort of moving response to the families, um, in which the families sort of commented on afterwards and said she was the only one who actually looked at us and actually noticed who we were and what we were on about. So, you know, it's possible to do that alongside doing the legal analysis of why they can't win, but nevertheless to express that great empathy with them. Um, and at the end of the judgment, she said, um, for these reasons, I would dismiss this appeal. I do so with sorrow, but my sorrow is nothing to that of the families and friends of soldiers who have died without knowing whether they were fighting a just cause. History must be the judge of that. So, you know, she just, again, makes that gesture to them, which is so important and is, you know, undoubtedly a caring kind of response. <clears throat> um, and the other sort of more recent uh, case from 2011 is the McDonald case, um, which is about a woman with um, restricted mobility um, who was reliant on the assistance of a carer to help her get to the toilet during the night. And the local authority, which was providing this care, decided that it was too costly and proposed that instead of having a carer to get her to the toilet at the night, she should use incontinence pads instead. Um, and the majority of the Supreme Court, all men, held that the council's assessment of her needs and their response to them was entirely reasonable. Um, and in this one, Hale dissented. And she absolutely, in a really trenchant dissent, and she said that, that Ms. McDonald, she's not incontinent. Her particular need is, get, is help in getting to the toilet. And so in that situation, it's completely irrational for the local authority to offer her incontinence pads instead of mobility assistance. Um, and she, she went on to say that a logical conclusion of the local authority's position was that it could leave people in their own faeces as well as urine during the night or even during the daytime. Um, and so, again, she was sort of really thinking about what this would mean for the person involved and what her concerns were and how it would be a horrible situation to be in. And it's very interesting because mostly the relations between the members of the court, the Supreme Court, are very polite and cordial and respectful. But in this case, the majority, she really wound them up. And they actually took the time in a couple of the judgments to specifically refute this point. She said, they said, faeces were not part of the issue in this case. <laughs> and they got really upset about it. They took great exception to that particular point. And perhaps because, as she has said afterwards, as men, they could suddenly imagine themselves in that situation. You know, they hadn't displayed much empathy with female anatomy in the matter of urination. But if we're getting on to talk about lying in faeces, then that might apply to everybody and suddenly we can see the consequences of our decision. Um, so that, that is a very interesting one. But at the same time, when it comes to actual mother-child relationships, um, Brenda Hale's orientation towards care becomes a bit, can become a bit troubling. And in fact, two of the rewritten judgments in the Feminist Judgments Project concerned that particular issue. So one of these is the case of um, E.M. Lebanon versus Secretary of State for the Home Department. So here we had a, a failed asylum seeker in the UK who was threatened with deportation to Lebanon. Um, she fled a violent marriage with her young son. And if she was returned to Lebanon, then under Sharia family law, the father or his family would be granted custody of the child. And so she was arguing that deportation would constitute a gross violation of her rights under the um, European Convention on Human Rights. And the House of Lords upheld her claim, and they agreed that deportation would result in a gross violation of rights. But the rights that they focused on were the child's right, and then also the mother's right, to family life under Article 8 um, of the Convention. So the decision hinged on her relationship with the child and sort of really elevated the rights of the child as a vulnerable dependent in need of protection to be the most important consideration in the case. And what the feminist judgment writer does, conversely, is to insist on the woman's sort of independent right um, to equality and non-discrimination in the enjoyment of other rights, um, so which would be grossly violated by Lebanese custody law. So the feminist judgment 
focuses on sex discrimination, something that applies to her as a woman, rather than family life, which is something that only applies to mothers and children. So she sees her as a person in her own right, not simply as the mother of a child. Um, the relationship's important because it still grounds the violation, but it's not all consuming of the identity of the person and the reason why their rights are violated. And then the other case is um, Re G, which is a family law case. So it involved the, um, a, a lesbian couple who had had children together and subsequently split up. Um, and the, after the split, the birth mother took the children and tried to limit their relationship with the, um, with the other mother. Um, and the other mother sought contact and a shared residence order. Um, and at one point, in fact, the trial judge shifted the primary residence from the birth mother to the other mother. And so the birth mother was appealing and her appeal was upheld by the House of Lords and Hale gave the leading judgment. And in giving the judgment, um, she sort of made some points about the fact that the, fact that the birth mother, um, the fact that she was the biological mother, or her biological mother, it was a, an important and significant factor in her favour which wasn't to be displaced without very good reason. Um, and she said if it had been a more traditional dispute between the mother and father in the same circumstances, then residence wouldn't have been switched to the father. But the feminist judgment highlights the very particular position of the other mother. So she's not like her father because she's not biologically related to the children. Um, and any rule that places significant weight on biological relationships is therefore always going to have an adverse impact on mother's interposition. So in order to be fair to both of the mothers, it's necessary to look at the actual relationship between each of them and the children, rather than establishing a priori preferences based on biology. So who actually gives care? Who does the day-to-day -day work of caring and nurturing? And the evidence was that while the relationship was intact, they'd shared care more or less equally, but since the breakup, it was the birth mother who'd been the children's primary carer, um, although they'd had extensive contact with the other mother. And so the feminist judge agrees that the children's primary residence should remain with the birth mother, but for different reasons, and for reasons which emphasise the reality of care and the specific situation of lesbian parents, um, rather than potentially sort of discriminatory status relationships. So those two cases also encourage me to think quite carefully about the possible consequences of judges adopting an ethic of care, which might have a tendency in some situations to collapse into a kind of unthinking and potentially oppressive kind of privileging of, of motherhood. So in conclusion, um, it seems to me that thinking about judging as a practice of care is useful in capturing some of the attributes and approaches that I, we, most admire and applaud in feminist judgments at appellate level and in feminist judges in their interactions with parties at first instance. Um, and these are attributes and approaches that we might wish other judges or perhaps all judges to emulate. But at the same time, there are dangers in a care-based approach. Um, on the one hand, the concept of care has become associated with a devalued feminine stereotype um, and occasionally can conform to that stereotype. And on the other hand, too much of a focus on care can be a bad thing, because so we need justice as well as care, and we don't need any feminist approach to become hegemonic. Now, that provisional conclusion, of course, needs a lot more work, as I said at the beginning. Um, and some of the more work that I'm planning to do around it, so there'll be further material coming out of the judicial interviews uh, conducted for the Australian Feminist Judgments Project, um, that project also includes an attempt to kind of catalogue a range of existing feminist judgments, that is, those that participants in the project consider to be feminist judgments. So it'll be interesting to analyse the collection and see what kinds of things come out of that. Um, and Eric Rackley and I are also embarking on a more systematic analysis of Brenda Hale's judgments, so looking at them all rather than just the headline feminist ones that I mentioned earlier, and trying to get a better fix on when and how she does and doesn't take a divergent approach from her male colleagues. Um, I've also been sent away by my Australian collaborators on the Magistrates Project to do more work on therapeutic jurisprudence and other forms of non-adversarial justice and to develop the care framework more fully. Um, but so, as I said at the beginning, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to float some of the ideas here today and keen to hear your responses.